I'm Dr. Dave Lucas, your preacher here at the Zion Church of Christ, and they say the third time is a charm. Let me explain. We've had two false starts this morning for worship. How did that happen? Well, I was all excited and got all round, wound up and had music for you. But in this day and time, everything that's digital can also be copyrighted. And if it's copyrighted, the Facebook won't allow it to go out. And so even though I thought I had a royalty-free set of music, it must not have been that free. So we're stripped down now just to me talking, and I hope that's okay. I want to explain a little bit why we're having virtual church today. And I'm sounding a little bit like a broken record for those of you who've caught the last two attempts at this worship this morning. The virtual concept is that it's almost the same, almost normal, almost in real life. And in that sense, you are there watching on your tablet, watching on your phone, casting this to your smart TV, or you're watching on your computer, and I'm here preaching to you almost like we were at the Zion Church of Christ building. But what's the difference? Well, we're not sitting, sitting together in the pews. Now, early on in the pandemic, you recall, they asked us to quit meeting because they said choirs were spreading the variant, the virus. Then preaching was spreading the virus. Then us singing hymns together was spreading the virus around. This uh, virus is airborne, and it moves from place to place, lodges in your nose, lodges in your mouth. Let me go down again. And your tablet is on the Wi-Fi here. Yes. And that's on the Wi-Fi here.
Well, I have to admit to you that this has been one of the oddest Sundays I've ever had in my life, and I'll pick this back up, but we're getting signals at the control unit that this is no longer up, that this uh, was a wrong target. What that means is that we weren't broadcasting anymore, but we are broadcasting because we just double-checked on some of our units, and so <laughs> I had this plan to say anyway, but do you, do you know where disease comes from? Have you thought about this at all? We've all been through this pandemic and there's been very little said about this. I've heard no one preach about this and I'm not gonna preach about this this morning, but this is a, what would you call this? This is a sidebar. This is a sidebar. It's off topic, but it does go along with what we're talking about. How did we end up with an imperfect world? How did we end up with a world that has big thorns, troubles in crop raising, uh, storms. How did we end up with an imperfect world that once, according to a Genesis, was a perfect world? How did that happen? You know the answer, don't you? So Satan tempted Adam and Eve, and they yielded to temptation, and they left the Garden of Eden. Now, the Garden of Eden is a reality, but also symbolic. The Garden of Eden was this idyllic place where God took care of these people the humans that he created. And then they disobeyed God. And this goes right along with our sermon this morning, so I don't digress that much. And so that's when all this pestilence and bacteria and viral began to affect mankind. And today we fight a viral. We're meeting because, we're meeting virtually because this variant of the coronavirus has really run rampant through Ohio and Meigs County and here in Lawrence County also um, where I drive from to be with you and it's a shame and I want to ask everyone to stay careful let's get back to washing our hands repeatedly if you don't have the coronavirus right now if you don't have COVID then make sure you take all the precautions you can for the next couple of weeks or three weeks especially, and to make sure that you try to stay out of harm's way. I especially think about some of our, our older members who we love dearly, who have been in the congregation for many, many years. We don't want them to get pneumonia, and that's what this sort of leads to. So we welcome you this morning. We're sorry for all the false starts we had. We kept uh, getting signals that we were down and that it wasn't working, and so I've, I've kind of done away with the music uh, maybe that was one of the variants that we had to worry about. So anyway, I'm not going to sing. Don't worry, I won't sing. So that's what we're talking about. We're meeting virtually. It's a virtual experience for us. You're there, I'm here. But together, we can work together to make this happen. So welcome. Welcome to the Zion Church of Christ, and we're, we're thankful to have you. Now, the first thing we're going to do is talk a little bit about communion. And what we'll do when we have our communion time we're going to put up what we call the placeholder. It'll be like a, a plaque, a poster, and uh, give you time to think about communion. But before we put that up, I did want to talk a little bit about the communion. And I want to uh, say this because this actually happened yesterday. Yesterday was a beautiful day uh, and uh, nice sunshine, and so I was working outside. And I had a friend of mine who said, I noticed that you at Zion Church of Christ, you, you all take the Lord's Supper every Sunday. Why do you do that? And at first, <laughs> the question kind of took me off guard because it's something I've done since I was eight years old. I was baptized when I was eight into Christ, baptized into the Lord Jesus, and immediately began observing the Lord's Supper and have done so. Uh, you probably count on one hand the times that I've missed the Lord's Supper for whatever reason most of the time. I've been able to uh, take a few moments to pray and meditate and take the Lord's Supper. And I said to him, well, I said there are several reasons. First of all, out of obedience to be similar or like the New Testament church, they gathered together on the first day of the week and they did this. They took the Lord's Supper. Now, that, uh, the church at Corinthians, the church at Corinth, got into a little bit of problem because they started having to be banquets and and people started bringing all kinds of stuff in, and they were, and then the poor people weren't eating. So this isn't uh, this isn't like having a a sandwich and a, a coke. That's not what this is. This is again, we're back to this idea of symbolism that God 
God knows that human beings respond to, that we like symbols, that we symbols are meaningful to us. And so we take the communion. Now, this communion cup I have here is totally different than the one I remember when I was a child. And probably pre-COVID, many of you remember, have nice glass cups that are in trays. And then in that tray or along with that tray, first comes this tray with the little particles of unleavened bread. Unleavened bread has no yeast. The yeast is bacteria. The bacteria represents sin. And so we take unleavened bread, which is pure or without sin. This represents the body and the blood of Jesus. Now, the early church did this on a weekly basis. And so those of us who embraced the idea of being just like the early church, try to get back to say what they said, be what they were, do what they did. That's the idea of sort of restoring that concept of worship, preaching, loving, caring, uh, worship, uh, following the New Testament congregation of days of old, right after Jesus in those first three centuries, they, they met together on the first day of the week. There are uh, factions of uh, various uh, churches, they call them denominations or groups that still do this. But we as a congregation being independent, Zion Church of Christ is independent. We're not, we don't belong to somebody else. Nobody owns our building. We own the building. We, we uh, uh, elect our preacher. We, we decide on how we're going to govern ourselves. So it's an independent uh, church, just like the early church. Now, so in this cup, instead of having glass, instead of having the other tray, instead of everybody touching it, because of the pandemic, everybody went to these little cups. The first time I saw one of these, was right at the beginning of the pandemic. And I tried to open it. I had no clue what this was. I hadn't, I hadn't seen one of these before. And so I didn't get this top layer. I grabbed this bottom layer. Now, there's, for those of you who are not familiar with this, there are two layers to this little cup here. One's got a little film on the top. That's what you get for the bread. Now you see I can't even get it open. And then there, that's, that's, that's the top layer. And here's the other layer. I didn't know how to do this, so I tried to open it up. Well, you can imagine I'm kind of pinching it like I am now, and it just blew everywhere. It was not a successful communion type for me. So I still was able to get some of what represents the blood of Christ out of that. But anyway, so I've gotten better at this. And so this has the bread. If you peel this back, yeah, if you peel this back very carefully, well, then you have this wafer, and it's unleavened bread. There's no yeast in it. So therefore, it represents the body of Christ. And then below that, I won't open it now because I'll spill it on my Bible. Um, below that is the, um, is, is the one where you peel it back and you can get to the juice. Now, you can get these. There are several churches around who have these. And those of you who might be uh, sick for a while, you can have somebody bring them to you if you want to take communion on Sunday, the first day of the week. And that's because the Lord raised on the first day of the week. So the idea here is that not only does this represent the body and blood of Christ, but it also represents us as the church. Who is the body and blood of Christ on earth? We are the church. So when we all sit together or when we are virtually together like we are now, we are able to take the bread together. Now, we don't all have to put it in our mouth at the same time, but we do this as a unified moment. And then we take the cup together. We are saying we are the hands, we're the feet, we're the eyes. We're the body of Christ on the church, on the earth. And that when our blood is his blood. He gave his blood for us. He's the lamb, the sacrificial lamb. He gave us salvation. We're testifying. We're, um, we're thinking about, we're pondering, we're meditating on all of the ramifications of this every week. Then my friend said, well, does it get old? The love of God for me never gets old. And there's no way that's possible. And my adoration for him only grows. So I can only say for me and for others that I've talked to, this never becomes old. It becomes more precious as I get closer to seeing Jesus and going to heaven. This is more precious now than it was when I was eight years old. When I was eight years old, it was very special. I was happy I was a Christian. And I was thrilled to be able to take the Lord's Supper with the rest of the church. And then when I was in high school, it meant a lot to me to come back to this testament that I was still living for the Lord. And when I was in college, 
I vowed over the communion time that I was going to preach the gospel and live for Jesus and try to bring people to Jesus. And when I traveled and preached, I was glad to have this moment. And it, it was commemorative to me. And now here at Zion, Zion Church of Christ in Meigs County, Ohio, I'm thankful to break bread with those who love the Lord. Um, and, and Bill tells his jokes at Sunday school and the women fix some of the finest meals in the world. And I'm, I'm thankful to be a part of all of those wonderful moments. And it's all because of the body and the blood of Jesus. He made it possible for me to have grace. He made it possible for me to be saved from sin. He made it possible for me to be able to go to heaven. I didn't do it. I can't do it by works. But this idea of this broken body right here, this is the idea of his body. I, I see his body on the cross. And I think of myself sacrificing. Well, it's not really sacrificing, but being submiss submissive and thankful and, 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 and purposeful. So we want to do that today. And uh, what I want to do first, before we take the Lord's Supper, uh, remember we'll have here in a few moments, we'll have a quiet time, and you'll have a, um, you'll have a what we call a placeholder that'll come up. It'll look like a poster. Don't go away because we'll be back. Uh, uh, they tell you never to do this on live video, but uh, we're going to do that. We'll have that there, and uh, it'll be a powerful moment. Um, I want to I want to pray today, and I'm going to do two uh, special prayers. First. Uh, I'm going to pray the blessing over the communion that when you take the communion, if you have the elements there, um, that um, that you are, are drawn closer to the Lord. And then we want to pray also for those of you who are ill. And there are many in our church who have flu or COVID. And that's why we're having virtual worship today. It's because they just can't go. You, you can't get out. You don't want to touch and you don't want to sneeze and cough and you don't want to infect others, but mostly you just feel so awful when you have this COVID. It's just terrible. So we're going to pray, especially for some of our older members, that they don't go into pneumonia, that they don't catch this. And I'm thinking about them. You know who they are. And those of you who are already ill, um, God bless your heart. Um, thanks for watching today. I know you don't, probably don't feel like it, but, you know, this is a moment for us to touch, reach out and touch you uh, with the gospel. So um, let me pray. And then... After I finish my prayer, the, the placeholder will come up and we'll take the bread first. Then we'll take the cup, but you'll do this on your own. It'll be silence. We won't be saying anything to you. Uh, we'll give you some time. Don't go away, though. I, I know that this is a transition moment and we'll lose audience, so try not to go away. For those of you who don't have the communion elements, this is an important time for you to pray for yourself, protection, and for others. Because the evil one is doing everything he can to stop us as I in church, as is evidence of today, because I did a video last night to tell you about this video, and it went without a problem. And yet this morning, huge hitches. Now, I, I know it sounds like a scapegoating Satan, but he's at fault. He's the one. He's the great destroyer, and he knows great things are happening at Zion, and he knows great things are happening for you spiritually. He hates that, and so he hates this. So hang in there with us. We'll have the victory because faith is the victory that overcomes the world. And he, if anybody, is part of the world. Satan is part of the world. So let's uh, let's pray right now. I'm going to pray with you. Close your eyes. Why do we close our eyes when we pray? Well, we close our eyes to focus and concentrate on God. And then we also bow our heads because he's greater than we are. And we want to show him humbleness. It's okay for you to go to your knees if you want to do that. That's a special posture to show that you are humble to him. Um, you can lay in your bed, lay on your couch there, um, be in your easy chair, close your eyes and rest. Let me pray for you. We'll put the placeholder up. After I pray, uh, it'll go silent for just a few minutes. We'll give you some time to take the Lord's Supper. I'll take mine, so I'll kind of know the pace as to when to come back. So God bless you. Don't go anywhere. <laughs> now let's pray. Almighty God, this day we thank you that finally we've been able to get this stream to go. And we know that we had a lot of attacks. And we understand what we're up against. Principalities and powers that we don't even understand. We don't even comprehend. We can't imagine. And yet we know that angels are on our side and that you are on our side. Right now, I want to pray this prayer. That everybody listening, especially those who are ill, will be comforted, lifted. I pray that small moments of 
uh, a, a heating blanket or a comforter or two extra strength uh, tablets that will bring relief to the suffering or a doctor's visit or a medication. I pray for all of the healing that comes through you for all of our congregation. We have leadership that are stricken, Father, with flu and COVID. We have a lot of our members who can't come because they just feel so terrible. And we're asking you to provide deliverance, not because we're special. We don't think that you owe us. And we don't, we don't pray this prayer thinking that you will smile upon us and not on others. But we're praying this so we can continue the work of Jesus at Zion Church. We pray right now that you would touch lives and, and help them and, and, and deliver them. And those who are very ill, give them some relief today and help them to see that they are going to get better. Father, also we want to pray as we partake of this bread that we think back to the cross, to the burial, and to the resurrection. Help us not to just see Jesus on the cross, but help us to see him resurrected. Because that is our hope and dream that this resurrected Jesus can provide us the healing that we need and, and that we can go to be in glory with him. And this world is not our home. We're just passing through this uh, dilemma until we can get to deliverance. We also ask you to bless the cup as we drink of this symbolic of the blood of your son Jesus that dripped from his side, dripped from his brow to the very ground, the very earth to the very people that were maliciously maligning him. He forgave us. He forgave them. And we pray your forgiveness today that we would remember your son Jesus at this communication, uh, communi communion meditation time. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your love. For the next few moments, give us peace. And as we take communion, dear God, be with us. In Jesus' name.
Now let's take a look at the scripture. We've been preaching from the book of Ephesians over the last few weeks, and we've learned a lot. And the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle. When I use that word epistle, it means letter. He wrote this epistle from prison in Rome. And the Apostle Paul preached so hard and so powerful that it made powerful people mad, and he ended up in prison. And uh, that's not all that ever happened to Paul. He was stoned and chased out of towns, and he, he, just, he just really had a lot of problems. But in this particular case, uh, we've learned a lot about um, marriage. In, in, in chapter 5, we've learned a lot about our relationship with Christ and what we're supposed to do. But this is an interesting passage of Scripture found in chapter 6, verses 1 through 4. So let me read this. We'll talk about it for a few moments, and then we'll let you get back to bed and drink your water and stay hydrated and take your aspirin and, <laughs> and take care of yourself. It's Ephesians chapter 6, verse 1 through 4. Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor thy father and thy mother, which is the first commandment with promise, so that it'll be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, provoke not your children to wrath, but bring them up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord. Now this is a powerful passage, and these four verses have some very unusual instructions for us. And today, we had planned to be at the Zion Church of Christ building and have fathers and their families come together and for those of you who had planned to come there with your family, I want to apologize to you and sorry that there's been such a rampant uptick in that virus, the coronavirus. But we're doing the best we can here. This first verse says, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Now, this puts us in a dilemma because we're supposed to obey our parents. If your parents are still living, then you're still their child. I can remember one time going home to the farm when I was older. I was probably 30, 35, and I arrived at the house. I was unloading the car. I was excited to see mom and dad, and dad said, hurry up, change your clothes, because we're going to go over to the hay field, and we're going to cut underneath the fence. Well, my first thought was, well, wait, wait a minute. I'm not living here anymore. I'm 30-some years old. I, I don't have to do these kinds of chores anymore. Then my second thought was this passage. Children, obey Joe Lucas because he's still your dad, and that's the right thing to do in the Lord. And I dutifully went in, changed my clothes, having driven for quite a few hours. Didn't matter. Got on a tractor, helped him mow. And you know, that was a good day because he passed me the water and said, drink this. It's good for your soul. And I still remember that. We had a good day that day. And I would have missed that if I had become vain and boisterous and arrogant and saying, I'm not going to do that. I'm not, I'm not living here anymore. I don't owe you anything. Children, eight years old, 18 years old, 38 years old, obey your parents. But look, in the Lord. If your parents ask you to do something that's against the Lord, then you're out of obligation. You don't owe, owe them that. Uh, so always remember, most of you probably had righteous parents or people who at least tried to do the right thing. But there are parents out there now, and we know this is true, that try to get their children to do things that are not in the Lord. So that's the qualification here. You are obligated to obey your parents in the Lord, for this is the righteous action to do. Now, he doesn't stop there, however. This is a pretty interesting passage, and you might have missed this before. Honor your father and your mother. Honoring means to put them on high, a high pedestal, on high esteem. That's why we have Father's Day. That's why we have Mother's Day. We honor them. That's why in the church we're very honoring the parents who are bringing their children to church. It is the first commandment with promise. What does that mean? Well, this is pretty interesting. This commandment, honor your father and your mother, and we know that's part of God's commandments, has a payoff, a reward, a premium. This is better than the lottery. 
you go to the store right now or to the grocery or down to the gas station and buy a lottery ticket. You don't know if you're going to win or not. And some of you have told me that you've bought lottery tickets and never win. I don't buy lottery tickets. I'll never win the lottery. But this is not a lottery. This is a promise. If you honor your father and your mother and sincerely do this, put them on a pedestal, this commandment, as you fulfill it, is the first commandment that was given that held a payback, a recompense, a reward, a promise. What is that promise? Verse 3, that it will be well with you. Children who obey their parents and honor their parents have easier lives than those who rebel against their parents. We all know that's true. You can argue this all you want, but I watched it over and over again. When I was growing up in high school, I honored my mom and my dad. I didn't want to do the stuff they told me to do. I wanted to do stuff they told me not to do, but I honored them and I tried to keep that moment of relationship between us, and I did. Anytime that I broke out of not honoring them, not doing what they asked, or doing things they asked me not to do, it was trouble for my soul, trouble for my life. And you can see young people here. You can see all around you. Young people who don't honor their parents, don't honor their will, don't honor their wishes, end up in chaos, trouble. You will live long on the earth. You will live long on the earth. This is a promise. In the Old Testament, you can see people who've honored their, their fathers and their mothers, and they lived a long, long time. There are people in our congregation who have honored their parents, loved their parents, and they're living good, long, quality lives. This is the secret for a good life is to honor your mom and your dad. So young people, if you're watching today, you need to think about this. To have a good quality life, you can't rebel against those who love you, your parents, your mom, and your dad. Maybe just your mom. Whomever is at home who is lifting you up in prayer, taking you to church, honor them. Now, fathers, we have a message for you. Now, it's interesting. People ask, well, where's the mother's obligation? It comes later. The Apostle Paul talked about relationships between man and wife, uh, father and son and daughters, mother and son and daughters. But right here, especially, he's particularly talking to fathers. I know it's not Father's Day, but this is when this scripture fell, and we have to preach what we see, right? So you fathers, don't poke your children with a stick. I have seen fathers do this over and over again. Does not, don't provoke your children to wrath. Don't do stuff just to make them mad. There are fathers who get ego, get an ego trip. I've watched them, and they provoke their children constantly on them, giving them trouble, giving them a hassle because their dad gave them a hassle. This is a cyclical thing. It's a cycle. So fathers, if you are a father, you have children at home, or you have children that now are older, don't keep poking them with a stick, hurting their feelings, making fun of them, telling them they're fat, they're stupid. I don't know how many things I've heard like this. As a Christian father, your obligation is to raise that young person up with care, with love, make sure they're in church, make sure they're honored, make sure that you pave the way for them, but don't poke them with a stick. That's what Satan wants you to do. Satan wants you to slap your children around. Satan he wants you to hurt your children. He loves that. And we see it all around us. I don't have to give you examples. You can pick up any news report on the on the internet, and you'll see it. You'll know it's true. There are hideous stories out there. Don't be like that. Don't provoke. What are you supposed to do? He says he gives you a negative, now he's going to give you a positive. Bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, this word nurture, we generally think about a mother. Nurturing means to a care for them, make sure they're fed, make sure they're warm, make sure they're clothed, they're getting enough sleep. Uh, they're getting exercise, they're getting sunshine. In these days and times, especially with video, we have to be very careful with these young people that they cag up on the couch and they stay there for eight hours, never get outside, never get fresh air. It's not good for them. How are you going to nurture your children? Well, here's what I think is going on here with the Apostle Paul. Nurturing is a two-parent situation. In most cases, it's better to have a father and a mother nurturing them. Fathers stay in the home. Regardless as to how much difficulty it is to work things through your marriage, stay in the home, stay in there for these kids, 
Don't go roaming off after some other woman. Don't have go out there and break up the house. You nurture your children. That's your responsibility, not only to provide for them, but to nurture them. Notice that word. Nurturing means to help them to grow. It's your responsibility. You've got to do that. And to admonish them in the Lord. Admonish them in the Lord means take them to Sunday school. Uh, if Volunteer for youth group. Take them places for the church. Take them to church. Make sure that your family has a place where when you come in, you sit down, they're a part of God's family. We need that here at Zion. We need you here in your family at Zion. Make sure that you admonish your children to follow the Lord. This then is your obligation as a father. Now, you notice it doesn't have anything here in these particular passages for the mother. But a lot of this, I think the Apostle Paul thought, look, these moms are already nurturing. It's part of a sort of a built-in concept for moms, but it's not for dads. We don't have that nurturing aspect. We have to learn it. And so I wanted to bring, sure, uh, bring this uh, to you today. My, I hope you get feeling better. I hope you improve. I hope your fever drops. I hope your cough, your cough, uh, goes away. I hope you uh, start to, uh, feeling better and more healthy. I'm so sorry. So many are so sick. But you know, God has not abandoned us, and we have to look to him for healing. So I, I pray that you will give God the glory. God bless you. Zion Church of Christ. Dave Lucas, your preacher, says, God be with you. Thank you for watching.